the key criteria I think that we need to be looking at is specifying the right materials and also designing for end of life, designing for deconstructability, for demolition um, and reusability of our buildings. Um, th this, is, this will be the most immediate action that we can take because it's within still our power and our control. Whereas other elements um, such as understanding what really whole life means and whole life carbon emissions mean will require a bit of filling that knowledge gap that we currently have. There are two approaches. So one is to um, you know, employ somebody to do a model of a building and look at the hotspots of a baseline building design and really work on trying to change some of those things out. But actually even simpler than that is just thinking about what are the things that we know will make a difference. So reducing the mass of the building, um, uh, you know, trying to reduce the amount of concrete used looking at where timber can be, in, uh, can be integrated into the design, those are kind of obvious things that we know will have a big impact. Um, you know, remembering that um, reducing material in the, the structure reduces material in the, um, the substructure as well. You've got to think holistically and think about the end of life of your building and the end of life of the stuff that makes your building. So at the moment it's a linear system, so we take materials, we make them into a building and at the end of the building's life, whether it's 20 years or 200 years, we expect the building to be demolished and thrown away. It doesn't have to be thrown away. We can turn that linear system into a circular one, a circular economy, and we can ensure that our buildings are designed to be material stores for the future. So we can, la we can design them to last a long time, but they, they might not last a long time. But what's more important for me is designing them so they can easily be disassembled and then those parts and elements of a building are reusable, which is really important. Straight away, architects can think about the embodied carbon of the materials they're using and in particular, we can, start, we can reduce and eliminate materials with high embodied energy like concrete and steel, which combined are responsible for 15% of global CO2 emissions. Um, and there are ways in which we can replace those materials right now uh, we, uh, you know, with timber or other renewable materials that, that don't have the same um, embodied carbon. And we can start to um, learn about, educate ourselves about what, are, what alternative procurement routes and materials there are so we can help educate and lead our clients and we can inform them as to the choices that they can make that can help to not only reduce embodied carbon and life cycle carbon, but can also save them money and uh, you know, increase the longevity of their buildings? Well, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an easy answer and there's a difficult answer. I think the, the difficult answer is to actually analyse and assess the carbon, the embodied carbon costs of what we're doing. And of course, there are metrics and there are uh, things like the RICS methodology, uh, the, the ways out there of, of, of doing analysis. But I think a, a much more simple thing is to just really think about carbon emissions from construction and use um, as important as sunlight or gravity that we, we just incorporated as part of our, our natural thinking. So from that perspective, we should be thinking automatically about, you know, how little material we can use rather than how much. We should be thinking about where it comes from. And of course, that has knock-on effects because if we're thinking about the carbon uh, sourcing or the sourcing of buildings and the carbon footprint of them, we're also enabled to engage with things like ethical sourcing uh, and um, uh, healthy materials and so on. So I think there's a bigger picture here, not just embodied carbon.